Father, we just, we want to honor you today. We want that desire that we read about in your word in, in Psalm, that desire that, um, that only comes when we find out that you are the only water that can quench our, that can totally give us refreshing uh, for our spirit. Um, Father, that we can't find it in the world, but, but only in a real connection and a real relationship with you. And so this morning, we just pray for that desire to come over us, to find you and to seek you and to just uh, to spend energy pursuing you. God, give us the desire to do that, to dig into your word, to, to dig into our prayer life and to dig into this relationship that you want to have with us. This morning, I just pray that, that you would teach us where it is that we can continue to push distractions out of the way, to push worldly things that are not helping us get closer to you out of the way and to remove the other gods in our lives um, that, are, that are taking your praise. Lord, we honor you today and we worship you. God, we, we lift you up with, with our praise and with our, with our lips we sing praises to you today. And with our ears, I pray that you help us to hear your word. God, I pray a special anointing on Pastor Trey today as he brings your word to us. God, we bless you today and we thank you for this time. We thank you for our ability to come here today without persecution. We love you. Amen. 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 You guys can have a seat except for you. You don't have to sit down because we're going to grab our coats because it's freezing and we're going to head out the front doors. Carl Bart was one of the the great one of the greatest Christian voices in the 1900s. And he was once asked while giving a speech, "What is the most profound truth of Christianity that you can ever ponder?" And he said without hesitation, "Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so." Little ones to him belong, for they are weak, but he is strong. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong, they are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Christianity really is that simple. The title for today is Training in His Way. The spiritual discipline of simplicity. Last week we started the spiritual discipline series with, with fixing our eyes. We talked about fasting and meditation. And we talked about how that's all about clearing away the clutter of distractions and temptations. And today we're going to talk about now clearing away those, those internal, those, those mind-driven things. When I look around me, I tend to judge people by their exterior actions. But when I judge myself, I judge myself based on what's in my head. And that can become really, really dangerous. Because we can see ourselves as far worse than anyone around us. Um, or we can choose to see ourselves by our external actions versus theirs. And we can see ourselves as far better. And the problem with both of those are we are starting with us and we're comparing with you. And neither of those are the right comparison or fair at any level. 
And so we're going to talk today about simplicity. It's about getting back to, to the basics of Christianity. Um, on, the, on the sheets that you were handed out when, when you came in as part of, of your long term over this week, what I'd like for you to do is something that I consider to be quite profound yet quite difficult to do. And the question goes like this. It's at the very end of it as one of the challenges. If you were only given one minute to tell someone about about Jesus, to tell them about Christianity, to tell them about God, what would you say in one minute? It's an awful lot. That's an awful lot to think about because because I'm not I'm not just asking for your one minute testimony of what God did for you. What would you want someone to know about Christianity? I mean, that is huge. And and yet what we see in the church um Let's back up a little bit. What happened when we look at the Bible, when we look at the book of Acts, we look at the early church, you're talking about a group of people who were being quite literally chased for what they believe. And so you had underground churches and you had things, you, you had people who were, were following Jesus and the example that he had set for them. Um, and there are places in the world today where we still see that. Throughout Asia, throughout China specifically, you still have the underground church. Throughout the Middle East, you still have the underground church. You have people that are being chased and they are dying for their beliefs. And so anyone that you find that has this basic belief of Jesus, they're willing to grasp a hold of. And yet here in America where we have this vast freedom to sit in our religion and get fat and fed, we tend to break up Christian fellowship over some of the stupidest things. We tend to break up over the color of carpet or the style of song or, or because, because I read this scripture to say this and you read it differently. But we tend to parse out the scripture when, when for years... When you think about the concentration camps during World War II, you had people that were hoarding one page of the Bible. One page because it was this one thing that they could grasp onto that would remind them of the promises of an all-loving God. Of a God who loved you and me so much that he said getting to heaven is not about this long list of do's and don'ts. I love you enough that I know those can be really confusing, and so I'm going to bridge the gap myself. And I'm going to come to earth. Because you could never live out the 1,142 laws that are listed in the Old Testament. You can never earn your way into heaven because it's too much. And so I'm going to bridge the gap so that you understand what I am about. And so we as the church over years have... have have bastardized religion so that it becomes something that's unrecognizable to God. It is no longer the child of God. It is is warped and developed into this this horrible little thing that, that doesn't really have a father anymore. Because religion becomes about about what I say is right or wrong. About what me, standing up here in front as the pastor... I can give you a list of here's 10 things that if you'll do this, then, then you can earn your way into heaven. In fact, this was, this was so proliferated during Jesus' day that, that each rabbi, each leader of religious understanding would stand up and they would, they would have their own rules, their own way of getting into heaven. And it was, it was about... It was about, you know, one, one rabbi may have this, this understanding that if you can stand on one foot, rub your head, rub, rub your head and pat your belly and, and say the Ten Commandments backwards, then you can earn your way into heaven. And, and, and you think I'm making that totally up, and I wish I were, but some of them were that ridiculous. If you can memorize 50% of the laws and recite them to me, then you will have done your duty. You will have earned your way into heaven. And Jesus, and, and so that, that understanding for that rabbi was called his yoke. 
Now, Jesus talks a little about his yoke. And he says these words, follow me, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now, wait a minute. Your yoke, you know, we think of that and we think about two mules. We think about two horses that are working on the farm. But we, we have been removed from that Middle Eastern understanding that Jesus grew up in. We often forget that Jesus was never a Christian. He was Christ. He was a Jew. And so when he speaks, he's going to speak from a Jewish understanding. And, and I can sit here today and I can spout off to you a ton of knowledge. But the problem with spouting off a ton of knowledge is you get sidetracked by the knowledge and we begin to forget the simplicity of Jesus' message. So, all right, I need to turn this on. Sorry. All right. All right. So training in his way, finding the simplicity in Jesus' message. So it starts here in Matthew 18. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus saying, who then is the greatest in the kingdom of God? Then Jesus called a little child to him set him in the midst of them and said, Assuredly, I say to you, unless you are converted and become as a little child, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself as this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever receives one little, receives one little child like this in my name receives me. And this isn't, this isn't an isolated event that Jesus says this. Just one chapter later, then people brought little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them and pray for them. But the disciples rebuked them. Jesus said, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. When he had placed his hands on them, he went on from there. In Mark, we hear this story again. They brought little children to him that he might touch them, but the disciples rebuked them as they brought those who brought them. But when Jesus saw this, <laughs> he grew greatly displeased. I think in one version it actually said he was irate. And he said to them, let the little children come to me and do not forbid them, for such is the kingdom of God. Assuredly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will by no means enter it. And he took them in his arms, laid hands on them, and blessed them. Jesus is in the blessing business. Jesus wants you and I to approach him like a little child. Now here's, here's something I have learned, maybe, maybe one of the most profound truths that I have seen in the, in the 16 years that I've, I've been a pastor. There is a point in time when people come to Christ. And in that time when people come, their faith is really, really basic. What do, you, what do you know about God? Well, I don't know a whole lot. Well, well why are you following him? Because he's cool. Because he loves me. Because he sacrificed his son for me. John 3.16, that's all you got to know. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And I love to follow that up with 17. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that through him the world might be saved. That's kind of the basics. And when, when people are first saved, that's really about all they got. And then all of a sudden, somewhere along the way, they begin to struggle with faith. They begin to struggle with Jesus. They begin to struggle with church. They begin to really struggle with religion. And so they start asking questions and we start dividing up those who, who believe in speaking in tongues and those who don't. Those who believe and, and understand uh, uh, Prophecy is meaning this instead of this. Or those who, who believe that, that we, should, we should dance in the aisles at church and those who believe that if you raise your hand, you're going straight to hell. You, you, we separate the church between those, those who, who, who love God and those who love ritual. And, and we tend to just divide ourselves and divide ourselves and divide ourselves. And that is because in America, we have gotten fat and lazy and we've had far too much time to focus on the, the minuscule words of the Scripture instead of the big picture of what God is trying to tell us. When we pay attention to the big picture, here is this. Um, I cannot believe I'm standing in a church and I don't have a Bible like in my hand somewhere. Thank you. 
I knew that there had to be one here on the stage somewhere. Here's, here's the truth of the Bible and here's what God wants you to know above all else. I take these two pages right here. Genesis 1 and 2. And I take these two pages right here. Revelation 21 and 22. These are the first two pages of the Bible and the last two pages of the Bible. And you want to know what these two pages have in common. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth and He created Adam and Eve and He lived in perfect harmony with Adam and Eve. Flip to the end. Jesus creates a new heaven and a new earth and in that place He will be in perfect harmony with all Adams and with all Eves. That, that is messy and dirty. What falls in between there? Sin enters the world and God spends the next 978 pages of this Bible dealing with how can I get beyond what humans do? How can I bring them back to me? Because I love them. Because I want to spend eternity with them. Because they are mine. And I am theirs. To me, that's the simplicity of the message. We can argue over all kinds of points of the Bible, but I don't want to do that. Within these walls, the last time I took time to count, there are 23 different denominational backgrounds that meet here every Sunday. 23 different understandings. 23 opportunities for an argument. 23 times the malfunction of church. And so what do we do with that? What do I do with that? How do I as a pastor stand in front of 23 different understandings? And that's just saying that, that on a grandiose level, there's 23 different understandings. When you get into it, on an average right now in this church, there are 85 people with 85 different opinions about one particular verse. So what do I do? What do you do? What do you do when you walk out of this room and you want to share the gospel with someone who just doesn't read the Bible the exact same way as you do? Share God. Share Jesus with them. Share love and compassion and, and share the fact that God loves you and God loves them. And we may not agree on every little dot and tittle as it's written in the Scripture. We may not agree on everything that everything is said because, because guess what? We came here with different understandings. We came here with different life experiences and we have all at one point or time or another interacted with God and we have heard from Him in a special way where He helped us through a moment. He helped us through a time and He gave us this one Scripture and all of a sudden it has a new meaning and a new understanding. And, and just because you read that differently for me does not mean you read it wrong. It means God has revealed something to you about that for you. And so, so we come here with these differing thoughts and these differing understandings and there is nothing wrong with that. Because the simplicity of the message is what we need to focus on. The simplicity of that understanding is how we are able to share God with people who just don't see life as we do. The simplicity of who God is has never changed. The world continues to change and things get all goofed up in this world and God must find new ways to reveal Himself to us. And because of that, we see God differently at different places in our lives. But He's never changed. So what is? What is it to have faith like a child? Oh, I started the story. So people have that childlike faith when they first come into the faith. Do you know who else that I see that has that same kind of faith? Someone who's at the end of their life. Someone who's asked all the questions. Someone who's been through all the struggles in life. Someone that's been a Christian for 40 plus years. And, and they come to the end of their life and you go, well, what do you think about Jesus? Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible tells me so. 
How is it that someone new in faith and someone that's experienced so much more than, than, than I ever have, how do they come to that same place? Because in my opinion, they're focused on the simple truth. So last week we started with meditation. And I gave you kind of a basic rundown of three things. Read a scripture asking for content. Read it again asking for intent. Read it again asking for personal transformation. This week, I'm going to add another one to that. Read it for the simple truth. And so today, we're going to practice that here. So I'm going to read a section of scripture for you. And during that time, in the first one, I want you to listen for the content. The second time, listen for the intent. Third time, listen for personal transformation. And the fourth time, listen for the simple truth. And today, I'm going to share with you when I've read these, because I did this before we got here today. Surprise, surprise, I actually practice what I'm going to say on Sundays. Um, I plan it out a little bit ahead of time. Not to the minute details, but I know what I, I, I know what I'm doing. That sounds a little conceited, doesn't it? Um, that's not what I meant by that, but, but here we go. Um, and I'm going to need this Bible again, because I didn't put it on my slide. So we're going to look at Luke chapter 15, verse 1 through 7. This is one of my favorite chapters of the Bible. Jesus starts his parables in Luke here with the parable of the lost sheep, the parable of the lost coin, and the parable of the lost son. To me, the parable of the lost son is one of the greatest passages of Scripture. That's just a personal. And so I'm not going to that one. I'm going to go to one a couple before that. So the parable of the lost sheep. And so we're going to read this first and we're going to ask what the content is. It says, Now... The tax collectors and, quote, sinners were gathering around to hear him. But the Pharisees and the teachers of law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Does he not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, He joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me. I have found my lost sheep. I will tell you that in the same way, there is more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. So so what's the content? Jesus is growing a crowd of the, quote, unclean, and the clean are complaining. So what does Jesus do? He tells a story. That's so Jesus. So that's the content. So let's read it again, and let's ask what the intent is. Now the tax collectors and, quote, sinners were all gathering around to hear him. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Does he not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulder and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, for I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. So what's the intent? Jesus wants to show how those called unclean are important to God. I mean, he's, he's drawing them to him. He's going and he's having meals and he's, he's hanging out. In fact, there's this one guy who who wrote the first book of the New Testament. We, we like to call him Matthew, but in the Scripture he's referred to as Levi. And he's a tax collector. Now, if you want to understand 
what a tax collector was thought of in those days. This is the guy that sold out the Jews to the Romans. So the best equivalent that I can put out there for you to understand how despised, because we like to know that, right? Just how bad was this person hated? Um, this would be an American who used to be in the military that's now gone to fight for, with, with ISIS. Okay, he's gone over to the, to the bad, the, the, the dark side, and he's now fighting with Darth Vader. So that's, that's what we're kind of talking about here. So that's what's going on. That is the intent. Jesus is eating with these people. He's eating with them. And, 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 and we're not real happy about that. So now let's look. What's the, what's the personal transformation for this? Let's read it again. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all together, were all gathering around near him to hear him. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you had a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Does he not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me. I have found my lost sheep. I tell you, in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. So, so what's the personal transformation? For me, this is what I get out of this. God wants to forgive our, or their, sins and reconcile us and them to Him. Now, just a, just a, a quick aside here. Um, if you find yourself on an occasion or, or regularly referring to those outside the church as them. Um, you're walking in some pretty dark territory at that point in time. Um, they are us and we are them. All of us fall short of the glory of God. They are not worse sinners than we are. They are us. Perhaps they've just never heard the gospel. Perhaps they've never seen it modeled for them. Perhaps, as a story that's close and dear to my heart, they made some bad choices and they were asked to leave the church at some point in time. Oh, that doesn't happen, Trey. Guess what? It happened to my family. It happens. I've told you before, I didn't become a pastor because of my upbringing. I became a pastor in spite of it. People get asked to leave the church all the time because churches are righteous. No, because they're religious. So now let's, let's ask one more question. What is, the, what is the fourth question that? What is the simple truth that this, through this story that God wants for you and I? Now, the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around and to hear him. But the Pharisees and teachers of the law muttered, This mountain welcomes sinners and eats with them. And so Jesus told them this parable. Suppose if one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them, does he not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulder and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me. I have found my lost sheep. I tell, the, tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. So here's the simple truth as I see it. God loves all his creatures and he wants to spend eternity with all of us are there things that we put in the way that can hinder that you betcha there are do i think that every person that walks the earth is going to make it into heaven i don't think the scripture teaches that but i think when it gets there it's our choice I think 
I think that if if we desire to spend life separated from Him, then He will honor that. But I don't think that's His choice. I don't think that's His dream. I don't think that's His vision for you or I. So what is the simple truth? Training in His way. Spending time with Jesus. Asking Him. We've done this all with Scripture. And I understand that there are other ways that people connect with God. When I was in seminary, we were taught about the Wesleyan Quadrilateral. Now that sounds pretty big and mighty, doesn't it? The Wesleyan Quadrilateral says this. That when we have a revelation from God or when we experience stuff, we need to weigh it. We need to be smart about things. And so does it match up with, with the simple truth of Scripture? Does it match up with tradition? Does it match up with the personal revelation that God has given you? Does it match up with historically the way God moves? And it's just, it's just a way that, that John Wesley thought these are some things that we ought to use. These are some tools that we can have. And so I've given you Scripture because I believe Scripture is a very important side of the Wesleyan quadrilateral. Gosh, I can't believe I'm saying that word in your church. Um, but, but perhaps it's even, it's even you're spending time in your car and you hear God's voice and, and, and He tells you something that is so important to you. He reveals Himself through a song or through a poem or through a conversation you're having with someone. Still ask the question and meditate on those words, whatever it is that is before you, and ask. Ask, what is the simple truth? Why does something resonate with you? Ask God to reveal Himself in that. But get simple with it. I don't need a seven-page dissertation over why you believe in this or that. What I want for each of us, what I want for you, what I want for me, what I want for the community that's around us is this. Let God speak to you. And when He gives you a word, when He gives you a phrase, when He gives you something that, that, that allows you to share His love and His grace and His hope with the people around you, say it. Share it. We've all been through difficult times in our lives. We've all heard words like divorce, death, cancer, terminal. We've all heard things in our lives that are very, very difficult to process. But in those times, God has never left your side. Whether you felt Him or not, whether you knew Him or not, you never went through things alone. Why? How did you survive it? Why did you survive it? And what do you do with that now? I don't see God as a puppeteer that makes us go through bad things so He can teach us a lesson. But He knows that this world is broken and that things happen. And He has promised us through His words, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I will be with you until the ends of the earth. And so if you're still here, you have a story. If you're still here, there is something that God can use you for. But Trey, I'm old. I've done my time. Are there caretakers around you that you can share the love of Christ with? But Trey, I'm shy and I can't talk to people. Can you show them the love of Christ? 
but Trey, I don't know the Bible. I didn't study it like you did. I don't, I don't memorize Scriptures. I don't memorize Scriptures either. I don't have that kind of memory. And you were never asked to be a scholar when you were asked to walk with Christ. You have a story. And that story, you know it better than any Scripture there is. And that story has legs. And it can change somebody's life. But Trey, I'm bald. So what? Trey, I'm fat. So what? Trey, I don't, I, you, I don't care what excuse you think you have. My, my response is, so what? We all have excuses. We all have them. But they're just that. They're excuses. You have a story. If you're here today and you don't understand that story yet, talk to me after this morning and I will help you to see God's story at work in your life. We all have a story. And God has been in it since we were born. Since before we were born. And He knows you intimately and He wants to work in your lives. So this morning, we're going to have an opportunity as, as we do every Sunday. There's a, there's a chance that if you're going through something this morning and you, you want to come to the altars and you want to pray this morning, we have a time that you can do that. This morning... This morning, maybe, maybe it's not something I said. Maybe you came in here with a burden on your heart already and you just want to come and, and you just want to lay it at God's feet. Maybe this morning you've got something to celebrate. Maybe this morning is about celebration for you because God has shown you something or given you something and you just want to come and say thank you. You can do that where you're sitting. You can do that in your chair and that is great and that is fine and we celebrate with you there but I believe there's something special about approaching the altar. There's something that is special about, about coming, coming to the feet of God and just laying it there. But that's my belief. So this morning, I want to give you an opportunity to just, just to take time and to thank God where you've seen Him and to pray for Him to show up where you haven't. This morning I want to give you time. And Chris is going to play some music just so that it's not quiet and awkward. Um, but this is a time and a place where you can come. So if you'll allow me, I'll open it with a prayer and the altars are open as a place that you can come and talk to God. God, this morning, hear our voices. This morning, hear our hearts. Father, this morning I pray that we have heard from you. I pray that You have spoken to individual hearts and to people's minds. That You have opened up the opportunity for them to, to hear what You have for them. Father, we thank You for the opportunities that we've had to celebrate. Father, where we have seen You at work. Where we have we've seen Kyla go home from surgery days earlier than expected. And we've seen... We've seen good reports coming from doctors about things that we were afraid of. Or, or maybe we've even seen bad reports, but we've found new strength. And we thank You for people like Miss Joanna receiving an eternal reward this week. God, we see You at work. And I ask that You continue to remind us of that. God, in this time, in this place, I pray that as people lift their voices, as they lift their hearts, that You will hear them and You will speak back to them. May they hear Your voice and know that You are near. Father, we pray that people's lives will be transformed because of the, the simple truth of Your words. The simple truth of Your heart. Because You have spoken to us. God, as we come in this time of the altar response, may You know our hearts and our love.